tovább megyünk a BDS-emben a második betűig, a D-ig, az disziplint, fegyelmezést jelent. Honnan ered a BDS-em egyik népszerű ága a spanking, a fenekelés fantáziája és megélésének a vágya? Sok olyan narcisztikus ügyfelem számolt be a fenekelés iránti szenvedélyes fantáziálásról, vagy annak megéléséről, akik azt állították, hogy gyermekkorukban nem történt velük abúzus, sosem bántották őket fizikálisan a szülők. Mégis nagyon-nagyon korán, már 3-6 éves kor táján már megjelentek a fenekeléssel kapcsolatos fantáziáik, amik végigkísérték az egész életüket, és olyan mértékű vágyjá erősödtek, hogy napi szinten is képesek erről álmodozni, fantáziálni, erre maszturbálni. Létezik az, hogy ez összefüggésben van a hamisén kialakulásának az időszakával? Vagy a Freud szerinti anális korszakkal van összefüggésben? Ott történt egy megrekedés? Miért vágyik valaki ennyire kényszeresen arra, hogy egy másik embert elfenekeljen? Miért vágyik arra, hogy időnként meg őt büntesse meg valaki nagyon keményen, hiszen így jön létre benne egyfajta egyensúly? Ahogy mondják, megnyugszanak, kisimulnak, és egész nyugalmat éreznek megpihenést egy-egy szeánszot követően. Well. As, as, I, as I said in response to other questions, there is a substantial, essential difference between relatively healthy people who seek spanking. And spanking, spanking is healthy. It's not associated with any mental health illness. It was never even considered as a mental problem or a paraphilia. It's perfectly healthy. So many totally healthy people seek it. And the narcissist would seek it, but again there's a gulf. It's essentially different phenomena. They look the same, they're not the same. I will focus on the narcissist, because that's the aim of the interview. The narcissist, at a very early age, associated love with pain. The problem of the, problem the narcissist has is that a lot of this pain is ambient, is, is implied. It's subtle, it's not expressed, it's not manifest, it's not visible, it's not clear even. A narcissist is in a state of thought, complete uncertainty. Am I being abused or is it my imagination or am I, as a child, yes? Am I wrong? And of course, as a child he still has autoplastic defenses. In other words, as a child he still blames himself. If mother is punishing me, means I'm a bad, unworthy object. I'm a bad child. I deserve the punishment. Something bad happened to mother. I did it. It's my responsibility. My parents are divorcing. It's because of me. So, child assumes responsibility via magical thinking to everything that happens in his environment. And so, he would perceive the abuse as coming from him. Because he is the the reason for everything that's happening, divorce, whatever, then of course, if he is responsible for divorce, then he is responsible for abuse. So the abuse that's given to him by his mother, let's say, he realizes it's coming from the outside, but he thinks he made it happen. He thinks he caused it. And so there is a powerful internal component in abusive behavior. The child perceives the abuse as coming partly from outside and partly from inside. And in many respects, the child is abusing himself, self-punishing self. And so the child learns that love, pain, intimacy, self-regulation, control of the world, they're all somehow connected. Discipline control of the world. So, gradually, when this child becomes older, he feels very uncomfortable with the fact that the abuse is unclear, uncertain, ambient. We don't tolerate, none of us, healthy people, we don't tolerate uncertainty very well. It provokes anxiety. And in order to reduce anxiety, very often we take drastic measures. Do you know, like we are waiting for the other shoe to fall. We are waiting to, for the guillotine to fall. So instead of waiting, we will do something. For example, uh, 
I'm waiting for my wife to abandon me. Instead of waiting for her to abandon me, I will abandon her first. Preemptive abandonment. This is very classic behavior of healthy people, and especially the Nazis, who is primitive, not healthy, is disorganized, is very chaotic personality. So spanking, and not only spanking, discipline in general, whipping, spanking, many other, and all these manifestations, they, they introduce certainty to the abuse. They make the abuse unequivocal, clear, certain, cannot be argued with. In other words, it reduces anxiety. By introdu discipline introduces certainty. Certainty introduces, it reduces anxiety. And that's why the narcissist feels much better after such a session. This anxiety is gone. Now, as anxiety is gone in spanking, for example, in ways which are, which are like multitasking, because not only the anxiety is gone, but he has a great feeling of intimacy. Remember that in the narcissist's mind, pain is connected to love, connected to intimacy. Actually, because he caused a lot of it in his child's mind, it's all, it's all the same thing. It's all his inside, his the outside. The outside is his inside. Pain is love. Not connected, is love. Love is pain. You know, everything is everything. So spanking, Spanking has multiple purposes. First of all, it clarifies the situation. It's clear that I'm going to abuse you. It's clear you will have discipline. It's not in the air. It's not, when will mommy attack me? Now, in one hour, in two hours, tomorrow, the next day. And I will live in tension, I will live in anxiety, waiting for mommy to attack me. No, mommy will now take the paddle and attack me. It's, it makes the situation clear. Clear, less anxiety, good feeling. Second thing, it's intimate. There's intimacy involved. First of all, my ass is, <laughs> and I'm naked. There's intimacy involved. And uh, intimacy is intimately connected with, with the abuse, with the pain, and intimately connected with, uh, with love. So it's a loving act of intimacy involving unequivocal, clear pain. Not speculated pain. Clear pain, the clarity is crucial, crucial, because it introduces intimacy, introduces love, introduces... Following the session, the narcissist would feel wonderful because he had received a dose of intimacy, a dose of love, a dose of clear abuse, so he doesn't have to be anxious. It has happened already, so he doesn't have to anticipate, and so on, so he, he, would, feel, he would feel wonderful, and he would feel even doubly wonderful because his view of the world, his Weltanschauung, his theory of the world, has been proven right. His theory of the world is, there's no love without pain, there's no intimacy without pain. And here it is. He received the spanking, and it was like an experiment in physics. He tested the theory, and it proved right. It's always gratifying when our theory of the world proves right. We call it comfort zone. When the world doesn't fit our theory, we never change the theory, we change the world. So if I have a theory that all women will abuse me, and I find a woman who doesn't abuse me, I will not change my theory. I will force her to abuse me. This process is called projective identification. So spanking is a form of projective identification. The narcissist forces you to abuse him because it makes him feel good. Abuse makes him feel good. It's his comfort zone. There he feels love and intimacy, and only there. But he doesn't want you to abuse him by silent treatment or by passive aggression. Or, no, he wants you to abuse him in ways that there will be no question that you're abusing him. It's totally clear, unequivocal, unambiguous, because he needs this clarity. And he leaves the, the session totally gratified. What's missing? Love, yes. Intimacy, yes. Discipline, yes. Control, I mean, everything. It's a total package. And that's the source of the power of discipline for narcissists. Uh, healthy people come for different reasons, but narcissists come for this. But how often come to the session? Not often, because uh, narcissists, it's like, how often do you have to test a theory in physics? If you test it once every 10 years. You, know. you don't test a theory in physics every day. You know. 
So he has a theory about the world. And he has to test it from time to time, once a year, twice a year, just to test it. He gets confirmation and he moves on. It's exactly like in his relationship. Narcissist, narcissist relationships have nothing to do with relationships. They are test experiments to test the theory. The only reason narcissist teams up with a woman, for example, is to test his theory that all women suck, all women are horrible, all women are abusers, all women are whores. So he teams up with a new woman. He teams up with a new woman to prove the theory, that's all. The minute he proves the theory, by the way, he loses interest in that woman. That's theory proved. So if, if he has a theory, for example, all women cheat on me, theory, because all women are abusers, and this is their way to abuse me. They cheat on me because, you know, I'm, this is the worst abuse for me, so they cheat on me, all women. And then you come across a woman and she doesn't cheat. He feels bad. He feels anxious. His theory is negated. And he would do anything in his power to push her to cheat on him. He would introduce her to men. He would introduce her to men. He would bring men home and leave. He would, he would do anything in his power. And finally, he will engage in threesomes as a, as a way to, to watch her. I mean, it's that strong. The need for validation, it's, it's called validation. Victims have the same. Victims of, a the, victims of abuse have a theory of victimhood. And they force everyone around them to conform to the theory, to approve, to validate the theory. And in future relationships, that's what I said yesterday, that trust and empathy are ruined forever. Future relationship, victims are so emotionally invested in victimhood that they will force the partner to abuse them, to be victim again. This is the comfort zone. It's a very powerful concept. And then a narcissist has a low supply or collapse. He goes more often, have this type of he sessions would, or no? He would tend, when he's collapsed or has no supply, he would need, his main focus will not be on abuse, would be to feel alive. So he would push the discipline, if, he, if he's into this, he would push the discipline to dangerous areas, mm -hmm. to severe bodily harm, to inflicting real damage. So he would, some of them would resort to cutting or to, I mean, they would go very far. They would push the dominatrix or to, to go very far. To feel alive, mm -hmm. to feel alive. Yeah. So then the, the motivation is different. Not to confirm the theory that all women are abusers and abuse is connected to love and intimacy, but different, the need to feel alive. Mm -hmm. So discipline alone, spanking for example, will not be enough. So he would, I don't know, for example, you would begin to spank and there's a, you know, you, 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 inspect, the, you inspect the area, you don't want to. Move. But he would not let you. He would, he would say, continue, 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 don't stop. Continue, I mean, until there is really severe damage to the body. So, because he would need to mutilate. He would, he would need you to, to really cut him, to, to mutilate him, to draw blood, to, to destroy the flesh. To, and he would push you. And if the dominatrix has no boundaries and, and is not strong, and the client is a dominant person or has dominant personality, and so, actually what will be created there is a dom-sub relationship where the dominatrix is a sub. And, and she will obey the, the so-called client, I mean the sub. She will obey him and she will inflict severe damage on the client. I've seen such cases.